Hello and welcome to Movie of the Year 2019 season. I am your host, Greg. Joining me, as always, is reigning best friend, Ryan. Hello, Ryan. How are you doing? Uh, I am so good. I it just... I just I love a little rain weather, you know. I love when it rains, but I mostly love when I rain, and I am oh! continuing to do that. Oh, you love Ryan. when you rain. Long may you rain in less. Coming in with an assassin's instinct, our challenger, all the way from dirty, dirty Philadelphia. It's Mike. How are you doing, Mike? Thank you for using my city's full title. Dirty, uh, dirty. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing well. Uh, I've been watching Ryan. I've been stalking him. I've been smelling him while he sleeps. Okay. I've learned well, his moves, and I'm hold ready on. to implement. That's what Greg makes me do to be his best friend. So we're just in like this chain of best friendedness. Uh-huh. Yeah. But now I've got the moves down. So not only am I going to destroy you tonight because you know nothing about Tarantino or Hollywood in general, not but I also know what Greg likes. Uh-oh. Shots fired. Shots fired right out the door. So yeah, Mike... You kind of spoiled my announcement, which is that tonight we're doing Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. In Hollywood, yeah. And Ooh, Mike, you also, yeah. you also uh, spoiled my strategy. You finally figured it out. Uh, when prepping for the show, you just have to ask yourself one question. What does Greg like? And then you uh-huh. win, if you can totally, answer that. Totally. That'll really help later in our Patreon-only trivia section. Uh, <laughs> there's some real doozies. Uh, either the answer's Greg or, or, or maybe Greg's cat or something like that. That's a little tip. Artemis and Athena. Artemis and Athena. Athena or Artemis. That's going to be the thing. (laughs) You know what? You both get a point. (laughs) I want the record to show that you both get a point for that. Well, guys, here's the deal. I, at the top of this show, have literally never explained what we do on this show. Uh Uh, A lot of people are like, wow. It just seems like if you're going to have a podcast, you should literally say what you do at the beginning of it. So people listening to it understand how it works. So this is a podcast I have put together. It was totally my idea. Everything you hear is my baby. Uh, And I have my two best friends. But I'm not the kind of person who says, like, oh, I have two best friends. That's such a weak... That's weak sauce. Yeah. You have to make decisions. I need to know... I voted for everyone for president. Who is my best friend. And so I bring you guys in. We all watched the same movie. This week it was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And uh, then I put you through your paces. It's a contest. This is a competition. You are on a game show right now. In fact, let's hear from our live studio audience. Normally quiet, but sometimes they make a little bit of noise. Make some noise, guys. Make some noise for our competitors. Oh, okay, stop, 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 stop. They're <laughs> angry today. They're, they, came, they come in every once in a while with their blood angried up. So when you hear Drop Pad say, Mike. Or Ryan. That means they're getting points. Probably the Ryan one. Ryan, would you say they're mostly going to hear the Ryan one? I would say, yeah. I mean, like, it's cute that you have a button that does mic. Yeah. That's funny. But uh, also, I want to point out, uh, Greg controls this entire show with such an iron fist that not only is he getting us to dance for him like we're fucking monkeys, but also, did you hear him start and stop that audience on a dime? Yeah. Like, he can, he has such control over I them. Have, He's I a have maestro. A lot of power. And you know he what? Conducts I, them like a fucking orchestra. I conduct you like a fucking orchestra audience, but also I love you and I'm in love with you. Okay, stop. Um, <laughs> they just they all come in. They all drop out all at the same time. What we like to do at the top of the show is we sort of give our general impressions of the movie. This is 2019. You guys probably. I uh, have not reflected on 2019 in a while. I haven't done a two or three hour podcast about 19 in like a week or two. Yeah. It's been crazy. So we might be a little rusty. <laughs> but tonight we are doing, of course, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood by Quentin Tarantino. And Ryan, you pointed out to this to me before the show. I'm going to give you a point for it. Ryan. What? There's pre-show points now? For no, Ra- it's during show points. I got the point on the show. For Ryan, there are, there are special points. Uh, Ryan pointed out... That this, this is, is the first. This is our first time where we've had a third movie from a director, right? Right. So we did. Let's run it off for the audience. We did Kill Bill, mm-hmm. Volume but, two, two, which did okay in the 2004 season. Yeah, although you did not love it. No, I no, I I didn't love one. Volume one. Okay, yeah, yeah. we all liked Volume two. Uh, then we did Jackie Brown. Which almost took the entire fucking thing yeah. down. Yes, uh, and then now we are doing Once Upon a Time. In Hollywood. There's not a tree hole there, Mike. I'm still saying the name. I was breathing because I also wanted to hear the ellipses. 
Um, yeah, I think that it's there's a lot of reasons why Tarantino is the first director to have three on this show. There's a lot of reasons to feel good about. There's maybe some reasons to feel bad about uh-huh. that he's the first one. With so many directors that we have not covered at all. But again, remember, Letterboxd and the audience makes these brackets. Blame Letterboxd, blame yeah. audience. Do, Do not you think blame us. He's going to be the first person to get the vaunted five on it? I think so. I, I I thought, sorry, I thought it was a legit question. <laughs> <laughs> they so really are. <laughs> They're all no, setups for drop pad. That's, that's not true. I'm, I, I have many different facets. I'm not just a drop pad guy, okay? That's just a rumor it's you just, may have heard. Here's the thing about Tarantino is that, uh, so Letterbox gives us the 32 movies going into the year. Yes. And then, you know, we, we take that down to 16 and then we do shows on the final eight. And he's just, he makes the movies that get into the eight. Yeah. Whether it's quality or quantity, quantity. Uh, it's really no, just the one this is mo- ninth because i know that because the movie's tagline is the ninth film by quentin tarantino uh-huh. it's an awesome tagline but yeah i mean that it just some directors are going to get cut out of that like going through the bracket thing that yeah. he just hasn't so i don't think we've done a year where he had a movie that could make it and didn't make and it didn't in. make it mm-hmm. well I, that I, I, Mike? I, well, I think, like, if we're going to talk generally about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, starting with generally about Tarantino, why he always makes it in. One, we're uh, straight white dudes who love movies, and so is he. So that helps. Uh, and I think that will come up a lot tonight. But I think he's somebody who loves the history of film, and nerds like us also do. And he also gets how much tongue to put in his cheek. And it's <laughs> all of his movies are combinations of, like, odes and love letters. And But isn't movies dumb? And yeah. he, he, that blender is so fucking perfect is for what we're into. <laughs> and just so you guys know how much goes into his cheek, it's all of his tongue or all of your foot. So <laughs> that's what. Um, yeah, I like. I'm so excited to be doing this show because I wrestle with this guy a lot. I wrestle with because you know him. He lives next to you. I, yeah, <laughs> get together. To I wrestle. throw the mat down. <laughs> we oil up and Quentin, we get into it. Come over here. Let's wrestle. <laughs> yes, I know you're gonna want to wrestle with me. You don't have to say that last part. That was my Tarantino impression. Um, <laughs> But uh, I saw this movie and, like, just flipped over it before I could even, like, uh, reckon with all of the stuff that's in it. Watched it again and love it even more. Um, I I want to either be able to, with you guys, figure out why that is in a firmer way than I have Uh right now. Or maybe talk myself down from a couple of these things. Because I am head over heels with this movie. I I think it's... I uh, Jackie Brown is my favorite movie of his. It feels so different. And two thirds of this movie is that vibe. It's just people hanging out, kind of yeah. bumping into each other. And then it's oh, but you want Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck at the end? And it, <laughs> yeah, oh, I still got that in me, baby. Like it really did blend in a way so many of his films haven't blended the best parts of him. Because uh, before watching it, I, I just saw it for the first time in prep for the show. I'd heard his best and his worst from different camps, and yeah. I. Don't understand the people who say this is his worst. It watching it the first time, I loved it so much. But then I got to the end of it, and we're going to talk about the end of the movie itself. But I got to the end of it, and I was like, I don't know if I feel comfortable with how much I like this movie. And rewatching it, I still, I'm just like, I, I maybe I feel uncomfortable. I can feel that I do like it a lot, <laughs> but there are some things about it that just make me feel very, very uncomfortable. In a way that's Quentin Tarantino to the max. Right. Not just like any one of his movies, but really like turned up to 11. And it feels like this movie is a challenge, both in the fact that I don't think it's very clear on the surface what everything means in the movie. Mm -hmm. But then also is a challenge because it's like, what do we feel comfortable liking and expressing a real appreciation for? In 2019. And that's why I'm just stoked to be one of the six or 7,000 people to get to do a podcast about this movie, you know? Like, we're going to do this. Um, Before we get to the end and answer all those questions, um, Django Unchained. That's, I think that if we do that, if we do 2016 or whatever, that's not going to make the top eight. I have noticed over the last couple of years, no Tarantino movie stock has fallen more than that movie. How about Hateful Eight? I mean, not fallen, maybe, but just. I think Django is now below it. Really? Yeah. Wow. Because Django, like, I think tonight that, like, Greg, you said in your intro about the conversations, um, I think he's super into that. And Django has no conversations. It's like, uh, hey, you know these, like, uh, people that are always put upon? Now they're going to get violence or uh, revenge and we're going to watch it? Yeah. That's sort of just it. Yeah. It just has the least to offer. Whereas you, Hateful Eight starts conversations. And then maybe all we see out of Django is he becomes the revenge avatar and it's like, 
we feel uncomfortable with maybe seeing how bloody he gets while he takes revenge, even though we cheer him for most of it. Right. Not, like, complicated, like, we don't leave the movie theater and we're like, I don't know if it's okay that I liked every element of this movie. Not complicated, yeah, I think that's the thing. Well, guys, what we what makes the most sense to me is that we would take a short break here and then go right in to talking about the movie. But yeah, yeah. that's exactly what we're going to do. What? 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 The ninth and potentially penultimate film directed by Quentin Tarantino, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, is the focus of our first episode of the 2019 season and the third seed in the bracket. Nominated for 10 awards and winner of Best Supporting Actor and Best Production Design, Once Upon tells the story of two straight white males, one an almost star, most likely on his way out of Hollywood, and the other a stuntman already out of Hollywood, who mostly now works as the actor's gopher. While we watch these two hang out and support each other, we also catch glimpses of Rick Dalton's neighbor, Sharon Tate, played by Margot Robbie, whose career is on the rise as she bops and boops around her soon-to-be-famous house on Cielo Drive. We meet some late 60s stars, we hang out around 1969 Los Angeles, and finally spend some time with the Manson girls, as all of these parties are about to collide on the fate-filled August night. The plot is close to non-existent, as it's essentially a hangout movie that is out to play with its history and start conversations. Taste buds, I ask you this. The responsibility of the director to tell an accurate story, the role of director as tone manager, the need to make people squirm with ultra violence. How do we, how would we like to attack the ending of this movie? Well, because he obviously spits in the face of the director's role is to tell an accurate story. I don't <laughs> know if that's like... We know he's into revisionist history, so well, do, why but, even be like, well, that's not what happened. <laughs> do you think that he has a responsibility, though? Like, do you think Tarantino, or even, like, if we want to move away from him and say Spielberg with Lincoln or whatever, do you think the directors and writers have any responsibility to that? I, I think, like, each movie sets its own bar. Each director sets his own responsibility level. Spielberg, like, anytime you're making a movie about somebody, you're probably trying to make a comment on them, but Spielberg's was trying Lincoln specifically good. Uh, he's trying to be like, here's stuff we didn't really know about Lincoln, but I'm trying to tell a story about the man. And Tarantino tends to be like, I'm trying to say things like he, he's super into like the Harry turtle dove. What if this happened? What changes it that way? Uh And what am I saying about the way the, the bigger ecosystem of whatever I'm talking about. And this one it's, uh, Hollywood and filmmaking in inglorious bastard. It's the world war two and probably filmmaking. Because, Ryan, uh, let me turn it back on you. What do you think his responsibility is? Zero. Zero responsibility. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's been a lot of talk, uh, as far as historical goes, there's been a lot of talk about what Quentin's responsibility is to, like, say, the abuse of women. Yeah. And uh, there is a lot of that in this movie. And Yeah, like, a whole lot. And that's, like, honestly, that's the thing I'm more interested in about the ending. But this other thing is more notable, right? That he changes right. the history. And it all, I know we're not supposed to do this. I know we're not supposed to say that, like, well, this movie makes me think that other movies are worse. But uh-huh. Inglorious Bastards, a movie that I loved, I sort of, like, push it down the list a little bit because it feels like practice for this movie. Yeah. The Adolf Hitler thing was so spring training right. to this movie's changing of historical, like, this is the major leagues. That it, it feels kind of weird now to look back at that movie. This, I think that he's doing a couple things. One, he's saying he has no responsibility to history yeah. whatsoever. Um, that this movie screen is like sort of his canvas and it gets to be changed 24 times a second, but it's still his canvas. He gets to do whatever the fuck he wants. Uh-huh. It's just his. And then there's also, does he sort of cheat with the ending? Like, is are there things that he does that sort of, uh, downplay the, I don't know, the strikingness of it. Yeah. For instance, the big theory is Brad Pitt's acid cigarette. That he's just tripped out. And so that, that, that the ending doesn't really happen, so to speak. Right. Well, see, that's okay. That's an interesting point because I, one direction I want to take it in is what does this movie treat as reality? Because isn't this movie constantly questioning, like, where there is a layer in reality to any of this stuff. There's no such thing as a difference between a commercial and a TV show. There's no such thing as a difference between a TV show and a movie. And maybe there's no such thing between a movie and just living in Hollywood. Well, I mean, like, if we look at Rick Dalton, like, he is this, uh, like, smooth... When he's acting, when he... uh, Bounty Law. Uh When he's that character, he's, like, this smooth-talking, very tough cowboy. And then 
when he's just Rick Dalton, he is then trying to be the actor that he thinks he, he's supposed uh-huh. to act as, as the actor. And then when he Ryan. gets flustered, he still looks like Leo. But now he has a stuttering thing. Yeah. And then when he gets – and then he also, when he is just with Brad Pitt, and this should be his most comfortable, he's still acting. And then when he's alone in his trailer, maybe the only time that we get to see the actual insecure, mm-hmm. sober piece of shit Rick Dalton. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and yeah, I think that that scene shows the pressure. Right. He's this neurotic ball of emotions if you're always acting even just with your best friend because at that point he's playing best friend. What would a, a best friend who's a little more successful, how would he be instead of just being who he is all the time, which is kind of like a petty, sniveling bitch. Is it weird uh, to be so obsessed with who your best friend is? No, not for us. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's totally right. fun. Right. There you go, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, okay, so I, the, obviously the big issue is that he changes the historical account that's that's what's most noticeable at first but Mm -hmm. i would kind of like to not necessarily stop talking about that but the the thing that really interests me in in this is how this movie handles violence towards women and how that that is played out to such a crazy degree in the end of the movie here's what i actually believe okay instead of talking about what i heard on reddit here's what i actually believe I think that that there's two things going on. One, directors never get the credit for being the hero. Uh-huh. And so now Quentin Tarantino, for the first time, is saying, look what I did. I saved the day. I saved her. I rewrote history, and I saved Sharon Tate, and I right. saved the 60s from smash-cutting into the 70s. And why not, right? If you're going to even put a Rick Dalton and a Cliff Booth in that world, you're saying, I'm creating something new to put into it. What is the result of my dropping in these two guys right in, into this environment, right? Right. You're already making something artificial happen. And if he can do whatever he wants in the movie, which, like, by adding two people who never existed, why can't he save Tate? Right. And and it's kind of interesting because they're not... They're still not typical action here. It's not just in personality, but, like, they're so much more R2-D2 and C-3PO than normal <laughs> action heroes. They just bumblefuck their way into adventures. Right. And other people make decisions, and then they bumblefuck their way through those people's decisions. But, but that's all unbeknownst to them the entire time. They, yeah. Oh, yeah. They, much like Tarantino, is trying to... I don't know if Tarantino loves these two guys. That's what I really stood well, out in the one second of, one. That's and, fucking one thing I want to I wanna try to figure out. In the second viewing is the first one, he was like, I got Brad and Leo. Yeah. They're going to be so dope. I'm not sure that he's such a big fan of these guys, or I think that he might see him in all of the good ways and bad ways in himself in these two guys. But the other thing, too, is that I think the other major thing is when you are bummed that we're not going to go watch murder people murder Sharon Tate like hor- horribly, like kill babies and shit, uh-huh. what does that say about you? If you're like, oh, I thought we were going to see that. But, okay. And then the other thing is when you, when you watch Brad Pitt murder lives, yeah. uh, Fucking Pamela Adlon's daughter, guys. Yeah, and I know yeah. Max, she's trying, okay? Uh, and you're like screaming, and you're like, yeah, I get to scream because this is a Manson girl. But also, also, what are you doing when you're cheering for this? Violence on women is redeemed through violence on women, right? And, and horrific, just as brutal as what the real Manson family acolytes did is the way mm-hmm. Cliff Booth... Like, how are we supposed to feel about that, Mike? I, I think... I think it's perfect. Like Tarantino is a smart guy, whether you love him or hate him. And I think he knows it's impossible to, for him to do anything, especially for him to do anything Tarantino style and not have violence against women be on everybody's mind. And it seems like the point is, so I saved you from this violence. I'm making you watch this violence. These are your heroes, but this is gross. Like I think violence is always icky and maybe he used to be part of the problem. And even at this, like, I can make it cartoonish, but you should still be uncomfortable. It doesn't matter if the hero does it. It doesn't matter if they say a cool line after it. Violence should always make you cringe. Okay, so that's what I want to drill down on. That's one of the things I want to really focus on. Because it's, it's, it's violence against women, but it's also violence, right? How, and does this matter, how does Tarantino expect us to take this ending? Are we supposed to be cheering, but very uncomfortable that we're cheering? Laughing, but very uncomfortable that we're laughing? Or just enjoying those hippies get their fucking teeth kicked in. I think while we're watching, we're just supposed to be uncomfortable uh-huh. and like on the wave. And then what he wants is, I am going to shock you. Not, not just like shock for shock's sake, but I'm going to shock you at what you are potentially entertained by. That's uh-huh. something you're going to have to deal with. And then when you leave the movie, one of the things that you're going to have to wrestle with is, not just me, if you live next door to me, but also, why were you entertained? And what were yeah. you entertained by? But in the meantime, I'm going to have you there like this. 
Allison Wilmore, who's a critic, I think, for BuzzFeed, uh, wrote this article about it. Um, and going back to like director responsibility, there, I think that we're going to talk about all this stuff about the violence towards women and the complicated things that he is saying. And I do think, Mike, that he is wrestling with the ghosts of his past. You know, mm-hmm. He is wondering how much he is responsible for the way that we watch movies now. But when there's a group of guys who are cheering this fucking bitch, like, yeah, this bitch deserved it, and yeah. laughing and high-fiving, does he have responsibility with that? Guys who will watch it but then not think about this any further than right. uh, what – like that, it's funny that somebody took a dog food can straight to the nose. That that's and so then hard, like, screamed nonstop after that point. She never yeah. stopped screaming after that happens. That her. was literally physically painful to watch. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but like it is. There's people who watch Breaking Bad and only cheer on Walter and never think him or Tony Soprano do anything wrong. Like, I but that's not up to the like, author to like. Right, and and so in this, Tarantino is the author, and I think it's by slipping in like the the Cliff might have killed his wife is such a weird. A uh, moment to slip in early on in the movie, and then not it, show it, and not show it, and <laughs> I think it's supposed to one like like okay, here's a complicated nuance to this character. Did he? Didn't he? It's Brad Pitt, so you know he's charming. But now there's this gross fact that might be there. Uh, how do we deal with uh, possibilities? And it's also so when he's doing the most violence at the end of the movie, there's always like, I don't know if they would have had to try to kill him for him to unleash on them. Like the scene of him at uh, Manson Farm, it uh-huh. seems like he wants stuff to happen. So it's. He's the hero, is he? Because he might just want to murder anybody right and now. And look at look at the way he fucking drives. I think that uh, Tarantino is making a big point with the way he drives, which is that when you drive like that in a movie, generally you're considered cool. Uh-huh. But this guy is imperiling everybody's life because he can barely constrain this like basically nonstop rage. And he, most of the time he does. He puts a very calm face on it. Mm-hmm. But the way he drives is like the f- severest form of nihilism and anger and rage at the world. And that's the way he walks through the world. So I agree with you, Mike. Eventually. Greg. <laughs> okay, I'll do this. I got a button here. But yeah, right. I mean, the problem with living that life is that, like, I know that you think you're cool and vulnerable. I'm talking about Brad Pitt, not you, Greg. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I do think I'm pretty cool, but I'm super vulnerable. <laughs> um, is that uh, that you can't die. And so you think that you can't die, and at the same time, you also want to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the way that he drives, especially in that neighborhood, which goes from, you know, like the busy Hollywood streets to a giant mountain where families live Uh is he's not gonna die he's gonna kill other people yeah that's where the violence is going to occur (laughs) ryan well we are going to get to i think touch on a lot of these issues throughout the show i think this is just the very beginning even though it's already the end when we come back we're gonna do the five bond james bond Three. You're tearing me apart! I'm not very bright, I guess. That's a classic right there. That's a classic right there. Well, we got five on it, and we are going to do a segment called The Five, which is, these are basically, there are various archetypal, is a word I just made up, uh, types of characters, right? It's like stereotype, but you can't get mad at it. (laughs) It's like, oh, that's important, I guess. Because it comes from science. Uh, Characters that sort of appear in every generation. And we are going to, with our perspective from 2020, decide what some of these characters were from 2019. So the first one I want to talk about is Han Solo. So we want the Han Solo of 2019. What does Han Solo mean to you guys in brief? And this is going to be different than the 2018 Han Solo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, she's a different one. Aaron. Oh, no. Wrecking Guard. Rockovich. Which, Rockovich. Aaron Brockovich. And then also different than the 2019 of Han Solo, which is Harrison Ford in Rise of Skywalker. Well, honestly, that he was just a memory there. So there was no Han Solo there. He wasn't. He wasn't a force ghost, if, just to clarify there. There was no blue goo over him. There was no goo No blue him. goo. I, I think important aspects of Han Solo is uh, he thinks he's charming. Sometimes the world does. Sometimes the world does not. Uh, Good, it's I very like laid back, but he, he has that Bruce Willis of Die Hardness. Of he's not a, he'll, he gets scared. Han Solo yeah. in the first trilogy is often scared and saying, like, we shouldn't do any of this stuff. Uh-huh. But then being very cool while he's telling everybody what a bad idea it is. I also think that of all of the tropes that we may talk about today... Um, sort of is from a different movie like you we have all these characters that act this way and then you from a different cooler movie landed in here above it all also he's got that like 
maybe I won't do good things. And then last second, he's like, no, I do good things. <laughs> uh, is Han Solo at all a downer because he's basically based on like a Confederate soldier? I mean, he's this, he's the Western Confederate soldier who like got so fucked over by the Civil War that you feel kind of bad for him, but then you're like, wait. But what were you fighting for the first time? Yeah. But, I mean, was he on the side of the Empire? Is that why he's Confederate? No, no, no. He's... I'm saying the character, his type, okay. is based on a, is based on westerns where you will because like, like I'll give you one example, the rebel yell, right? That's mm-hmm. a very popular thing. When Han Solo charges a whole bunch of Imperials, he does the whoop, like the whole like the way his pants look. He's supposed to be, I think he's based on like Josie Wales, right? So Josie, the outlaw Josie Wales from that western, uh, was like a southern colonel or something or general and then got screwed over by the north who were so mean but just like mm-hmm. josie wales i mean it, especially if you put an actor like eastwood or uh harrison ford in that where uh doesn't have a ton of range except for just like sort of cool uh-huh. we are willing to forget all that shit for the duration of this movie yeah you know we just want to root for them and especially well, because it is in josie wales like he is it was a long time ago way before the civil war in a galaxy true. far far away i think it's i think i do think there's enough removed that i'm not going to feel weird about loving this archetype no that makes sense to me also who do you guys think it was from 2019 side note who's going first uh i'm a ryan i'm like i got eye contact on you why don't you go first mike i uh, loved all the ways that you explained han solo and that's why i think that my pick is perfect by the way i have declared that i will win all five of these points oh yeah yeah just uh ahead of time let it be known ryan already said he was going to win each one of these and if he does i'm going to give him a whole slew of extra points for it but if you don't what? you will be punished if he does <laughs> so, do i get extra points yeah well yeah definitely the 2019 person that like uh sort of fits into the movies that they're in um or the tv shows that they're in but doesn't is just above it all but not like not admired so much by the characters in there. Always has a thing to say. Plus, it's 2019, guys. Let's remember that change is about to happen. It's Aquafina. Okay. I think Aquafina is the Han Solo that we need right now. Ooh, that's pretty good. That's that pretty is cool. Plenty of Greg. I like that. Yeah, that's very much my shit. Obviously. Okay, Mike. That's a high bar. Aquafina. I could see. I could definitely see her pulling it off. I'm excited about this. I'm. I'm hesitant to move on. And not just give you the point right now, Ryan. Well, just to one up me, Mike's going to say Taylor, and then I'm fucked. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, I but t- Taylor never thinks he's above it. He, uh, I think somebody that I like the from a different movie, somebody who who's elevating what they're doing. Uh, I'm going to put always suave, but makes you raise an eyebrow. It's Lakeith Stanfield. Oh, that's a good one too. I want to see that dude in a vest lounging backwards. Uh huh. Kind of just being cooler than the whole situation. Yeah. But then secretly, Heart of Gold. Also, hanging out with uh, Donald Glover's Lando. And so, who is Paperboy? <laughs> <laughs> Paperboy could be uh, Greedo? What A if, young Jabba the Hutt. What if he's just Paperboy? <laughs> he's still Paperboy. He's just hanging out. <laughs> he's just hanging out. Paperboy's trying to sell cool, spice. Man. He would hang out with aliens. Paperboy would actually kind of be an okay choice for Han Solo. Like, acts like an outlaw. Mm-hmm. Uh, acts really hard. And then just every once in a while, he's just like, I've got a ton of emotions and I feel things so deeply. <laughs> also, of all these actors that are like sprouting now uh, at, that are at this age, he's the one whose name I cannot remember um, that I would like put heavy Oscar money on. Uh-huh. I think yeah. he is going to dazzle us at some point. All right. Well, my choices are between Aquafina and Lakeith Stanfield. Aquafina. Ryan takes it. Jeez. Ryan. And he is already on his way to those sweet bonus points for calling his shot. Mike, next up is Frankenstein's monster, uh, who it kind of like his son, right? So just can't we call him Frankenstein? Like Frankenstein I mean, Jr. Yeah, Fra- yeah. FJ, who, your dad made you. So uh, come on, baby. So we are. are I'm <laughs> Handcart Brooklyn's monster. Is how people exactly. Know yeah, me. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they also know you as Handcart Bro- Handcart Brooklyn. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what do we think of when we think of Frankenstein's monster? I, I think it's somebody who is is can be scary, but with with a heart of gold. Like there's something in there that makes you root for them, uh-huh. but they are also you're worried they're gonna rip everybody's throat out. Of yeah, like maybe they're gonna pick you up and chuck you in a lake. And you're like, we deserve this, but it's still bad. Like <laughs> <laughs> it's complicated. I think that you, the audience is supposed to like want to go for their pitchfork that they brought to the theater, which yeah. is so dangerous. And then, well, what if that train tries to come back here? <laughs> I'm gonna pitchfork that train to death. Um, but 
has to then like evoke pity from the audience and almost like empathy from the audience with almost no dialogue. Uh, I think that's hard to do. Yeah, one one way to do it is not throw a girl in a lake. Yeah, that's gonna ruin it right there. Well, she's like, that. please, I want to see how far I could get in that lake, but I can't swim. Throw that. Do, girl. do you guys think um, that anyone who went to that movie and saw the train coming? stood up and pretended to run away like they were afraid as a bit. And yeah. then later, later people were like, somebody actually ran away. <laughs> no, I was, no, I was doing something. No, oh, come on. A I didn't, too defensive. I didn't think a train was going to come into the theater. And then come he realized, on, Charleston, it, just say you were afraid. <laughs> he realizes that in 1919, they didn't have bits yet. He was like, shit, uh, 10 years from now, this would have killed. The bit. You guys, your kids are going to love these things <laughs> called bits. Okay, so who is 2019's Frankenstein's monster, Frankenstein? I, I think physicality is a big part of it. I think uh, doing a lot with small roles, he, he big splash in the beginning of the year in a small role, and then at the end of the year with us and Watchmen, I think Yahya Abdul-Mateen II would uh-huh. crush. Plus, he's the second. He is Yahya Abdul-Mateen's monster. Uh, <laughs> he, he plays Dr. Manhattan in, in, in Watchmen. Okay, um, excellent. And he's in the new Candyman, right? And he's in the oh, new Candyman. This that's guy the new is Candy fucking. Is. He was Black Manta in in Aquaman. I think this guy elevates every role he's in. He's so good with so little. Covering all of pop culture's most important villains, like Candyman <laughs> or Black Manta. <laughs> good job, bud. Okay, Ryan, who do you got? Because that's a pretty good one. I'm thinking of a guy who uh, had more dialogue in 2019 than anybody else, but. Uh, the moments where he didn't have dialogue really made them work. I'm thinking about whenever he's trying to use the force and has to make that face. I'm trying. I'm thinking about when he's reading love letters from his wife, like two years after she wrote it, and it's 30 seconds of just him trying not to cry with the son. Uh-huh. I'm also thinking body type a little bit. I'm uh-huh. saying 2019's uh, big boy Adam Driver. <laughs> he is a big boy. Well, Ryan, that just takes it right away. That is Frankenstein, man. Farts. That is modern day Frankenstein. Okay, the next one is Marilyn cool. Monroe. We are not going to speculate about what makes someone Marilyn Monroe. I think this one is pretty obvious. Oh, I thought it's because we would get dirty. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Also uh, for that reason, just a core of damage and just a lot of layers trying to hide that the whole time, but you can feel it. Yeah, like uh, beautiful and innocent and like d- deeply tragic and just so harmed by a world. Um, <laughs> But then also we're like attracted to her, and it's like, how could you even? She's so she's obviously just flailing. Why would you? Yeah. Um. So bring me those. Bring me those, Ryan. Okay. Uh, before I give this, I want to say that Michelle Williams played Marilyn Monroe in a movie a couple of years ago. So it's not just about the curviness; it's about trying to capture that essence. Uh huh. And I really think that there's only one actor right now that uh, is doing that. Just that, like that inexplicable thing that Marilyn Monroe does, and this year's movie for her was Hobbs and Shaw. It's Vanessa Kirby who oh! has that blonde, gorgeous, like enchanting look about her. Okay, I gotta say though, I noticed you kind of framed your argument around. I like did that. a little bit. Yeah, she didn't have to have a specific body type. Uh, who is if if those of us who haven't seen who are monsters and have yet to see Hobbs and Shaw? Oh, she's also this? Princess Margaret from The Crown. Okay, she's like. One of their brothers in Hobbs and Shaw. I can't remember which one's Hobbs and which one's Shaw. She is uh, Shaw's little sister. Little sister. Gotcha. She does uh, not play one of their brothers. She doesn't play one of their brothers. <laughs> that's a, that's no. a lot of range. Um, her her brother in real life um, goes around and like eats people and floats. Just a big pink balloon that like destroys everything in his wake. Oh, Kirby! I, I thought she was related Kirby. to a, serial, a cannibalistic serial killer. Ryan. I was like, I'm aware this is a joke. But I'm not sure what the joke well, means, I'm gonna so I'm going to kind of just second. mull over it <laughs> until I figure out what he's saying. But I won't say anything in the meantime. That way I don't betray that I don't get it. What I'm trying to do here is just not break Marilyn Monroe down to just her boobs and butt. That's okay. what I'm trying to do. If you guys want to do different things, then that's up to you. I, I'm also going to go with the talent and, and underrated, somebody who can always do more than the directors are throwing at them. Uh, and I'd say the reason for this season, uh, it's Margot Robbie. Somebody who can steal a movie in a scene, and you can see why people throw their lives away for her, and you also want to nurture her at all you times, really, like, since she blew up. You really did bring me some stick-thin gals, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, It's an uh, energy, not a curve. Then it's Vanessa Kirby. Ryan. This is... Ryan. 
She might not be curvy, but she Free is curvy. Ru- Mike, there's a freight train coming, man. You got to you And I would run away from that screen. You got to do something here. But it's a bit. Okay, the next man needs no introduction. He's the Batman. I'm the Batman. <laughs> I have an important announcement about the Batman. <laughs> I'm the Batman. <laughs> it's me. The good thing about that announcement is that one of your powers is disappear immediately, and no one sees where you go. <laughs> you so. don't have to deal with the aftermath. <laughs> Mike, who is the Batman for 2019? I, 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 I think you, you want the big and brooding. Uh, you always want the, the, the Bruce Wayne side of it. No, nobody's tapped into the paranoia of the Batman. In the Ooh. way the comics are. And I think somebody who can be charming, but also very, like, scary to deal with and always think some... Lee Pace, I think, has the eyebrows and jawline and hulking physique and just... Oh, this is Hulk and Catch Fire? Is yeah, this Ronan Hulk the Fire. Accuser? Ronan okay. the Accuser, which we, he was underserved by Marvel. I, I think he would fucking destroy as later paranoid Batman who's out to kill all the Justice League just in case they might want to cut him off. Well, they bring him the back and. In- they bring him back in movies where they don't even need him just to get a little bit more Lee Pace. Mm-hmm. You know, like Captain Marvel's like, I don't know who to bet on this week in sports. Let's go to Ronan the Accuser in the booth. I have to say, one thing I like about this is that that's actually my boyfriend, Lee Pace. Oh, it is? Yeah, so uh, that would really work out for me. That would, man, Ryan, that's a high bar. He would make a fucking awesome Batman. Also, that guy is what? He's like seven feet tall, right? Yeah. Yeah. There, there's that article that recently came out where Amy Adams, our best living actress, yeah. Uh, they had to remove him from the set because she couldn't do her job when he was around. He's so losing sexuality. I think when I think it was when I was reading that article that I was like, I like this guy. <laughs> like hey, Amy Adams, like straight up. I just have to tell you guys, like I, I to be around him, I just like I could not concentrate, and so they had to send him home. And not even in the <laughs> middle of an too interview. Sexy, please get out of here. Like she ran around and found a reporter just so she yeah. could tell somebody. That. A press conference. <laughs> All right. Ryan, can you do it, man? <laughs> this this se- is big. It's getting really big here. This seems hard, but I, I want to think about 2019. I want to think about, let's think about acting styles and how there's been Batman and this person, we have, it's proven, like, has proven it a million times of like, when you're in an action scene, you act this way. When you're in a non costume scene, you just want to be this person because Bruce Wayne is like charming a little. Like, maybe transparent, but you still love him anyway. Uh-huh. Um, this person's a little older. We're going to have to go, like, more Dark Knight Returns. Okay. Uh, definitely older than Robert Pattinson. But if 2019 has a franchise open, it's got to go to Keanu Reeves. <laughs> who I think if everybody, everybody, like, when Ben Affleck quit, everyone took a deep breath. Like, what is going to happen? Uh-huh. And everybody seems okay with Robert Pattinson. And that probably has a lot to do with Heath Ledger. I'm just saying, like, well, we all hated that, and then he killed it. Uh-huh. But if it was Keanu Reeves, not only do I think he could crush the part and be 2019's Batman, but also everyone would immediately exhale, and, like, they would be so warm and emboldened after that. Ryan. <sighs> Are you fucking kidding me? I never, I never hit you with the crickets, and you know that. Oof. You hit Keanu Reeves with the crickets. I, I Pop know. Filter Hall of, is Lee Pace in the goddamn Pop Filter Hall of Fame? He's in the Hall of Fame of my heart, Ryan. It definitely goes to my... God yes. damn it. And because what? of... Oh, your come on. Pride. <laughs> you said you were going to go five for five. That's a bold claim. Has anyone ever gone four for five? And, oh, you're going to double I'm, down? Du- I'm going to double or nothing on this. I'm going to double on... Because you're going to double down, son. Okay, here we go. Greg, I want you to look at my confidence, and I want you to see that my body is surrounded by two giant fried chicken breasts. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad I didn't talk in the beginning because uh, Keanu Reeves as Bruce Wayne, as Keanu Reeves in Always Be My Maybe, would be a great, goofy-ass, <laughs> likes TM Bruce Wayne. Okay, last up, believe it or not, is Ripley. Now, we haven't done Ripley from Alien and from Aliens and from Alien 3. Is and from Ripley? Alien Resurrection. Alien Resurrection. Um, but so, what goes? What is a Ripley? What makes one a Ripley? I think I think Ripley has a lot of what uh, John McClane has. It's action hero who doesn't seem like one. Ripley isn't a fucking badass in Alien. Uh-huh. She's often scared, but then she just like puts it. Just like what I think every woman can do in a, an emergency situation is save everybody's ass or at least her own. <laughs> uh, just very con- like very panically calmly makes decisions like even though she is freaking out she's like but the- here's the best choice and doesn't let blind rage or fear 
make her just sprint into walls. She I never al- says game over, man. <laughs> <laughs> so important. I also think there's a, there's a ton of pressure on this because even more than like even more than like Laurie Strode or even more than Diana Prince, this is the this is the person who just like uh, told so many audiences that women can take the lead in an action movie and be badass. Uh-huh. And this is, I think, like. This has the most importance. And she's a badass not because she's highly trained, as Mike pointed out, right? But she's a badass because you just can't back her down. Right. So she's just another person on a spaceship, but she's, like, the one who just can't be defeated. So I'm going to go to Ryan first. Ryan, who is your Ripley? So I I need someone. I need the person that we trust the most to take over this role. The person who, I, in all honesty, I know that can do anything, but... That includes Ripley. Uh-huh. Uh, I think that she is perfect for it. And yes, I'm going to keep it female. I'm not going to do this whole thing where it should be a male now. <laughs> I think it should be a girl. She's a little shorter than Sigourney Ooh. Weaver. <laughs> but, <laughs> same height or bust. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's okay. <laughs> Guys, it's the one. It's the only uh, Florence Pew! Oh. That feels like a cheat. How is oh, that a cheat? Because of dang. perfection? You, you could just say her in any role. Oh, <laughs> no. but he didn't. He but I her saved her for this. this one. So, while I uh-huh. love the pew, 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 okay. I think a big part of Ripley is uh, every woman, every person. And I don't know. She doesn't have that. She she owns every room she's in. Uh-huh. Oh, much unlike Florence Pugh. She's not just a Joe on the street. I'm saying Florence Pugh has never been a Joe on the street. I'm saying Ripley ca- is just a cut up part of the crew. But she wait, is that. Sigourney Weaver? Yeah. That's who it is, right? Mm-hmm. That, like, is she just run of the mill every day? Especially back then, yeah. I think she could play it. I don't know if she could play that every person now. It's the reason why she's in charge of secret government operations every time she's in something now. Do like, you think she just looks bad because she's got curly hair? Doesn't she have curly hair? I'm not talking about hair? looks. I'm talking about energy. Is that what you're saying, though? That you think people with curly hair are, are ugly? I would people? never say that. I'm, I think people with curly hair are actually more attractive. Oh, oh, so people with straight oh. hair are discussing ugly yes, people. Yes, that's I'm standing on that. Uh, <laughs> but I, I can't get points. Who showed their action chops and they're like every person I can be a fuck up chops uh, was Rosa Salazar from Alita: Battle Angel and then the Amazon show that I can't remember the name of right now with Undone. Kirk. Undone. Thank you. Now uh, would she somehow be obscured so that we could not see the I actual? Hope, yeah, woman, I hope or? to see her face. <laughs> I think you ruined it right there. Is she For a, her chance. What if she turned out to be one of these computer generated stars? That yeah, that just never the, existed. The yeah, that'd she's, be wild. Well, because there isn't Jeff there a, Bezos like put her like in the algorithm, and that's what we wanted. Isn't there a pop star from like maybe Korea or Japan who is like Hazuyi? I don't know. There is like there's already a pop star who's just a fa- like really? artificial construct. Yeah, um, but I'm sure she exists. Rose Salazar. I'm sorry. I'm sure you're a real person. <laughs> I don't mean to say that. But Florence Pugh, yeah, you got to go. Ryan. Anytime you can get Florence Pugh. Ryan, would you read us the answers, the correct answers for 2019? 2019's Han Solo is Aquafina. Uh, 2019's, this is Frankenstein's monster, just says FRA, but I'm going to assume that's not Fraser. Fraser's monster, <laughs> Niles. Is Adam Driver. Your Marilyn Monroe is Vanessa Kirby. Your Batman is Leeward Paceson. Yeah. And your Ripley is Florence. Boo! You know what, Mike? Mike. You're going to get a couple more. That's insane. Because I got four out of five. Because and I lost it. so many points. You know what, though? We got to support Mike. We got to be good. Oh, no, I, this Take good. your pity points. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want them, but there's nothing Ripley in Florence Pew. What we're going to do, guys, is we are going to decamp from this segment. We are going to leave, and we're going to go into the Valley of Patreon only. So if you are a Patreon listener, follow us, won't you? If not, we'll see you on the other side. Tarantino has been known as the master of the pop culture pastiche. But what is Quentin doing with pop culture and the world of entertainment here? I, it's, it's weird. That I think this movie is both... Uh... The the most outright love letter. He's it's crazy. He hasn't made a movie about Hollywood before this. Uh-huh. Uh, it's the most outright love letter, but it's also undercutting everything because all these Cliff and Rick types were only heroes, and now he's saying, "Look what weak pieces of shit they are." Mm-hmm. Throughout the whole movie, so it's right. it's an ode to the thing I loved before, while injecting a lot of I understand also what is real about it now. The other thing, too, that, like, is hard to notice, like, it just slipped my mind the first time, but the second time, all of his movies that, like, basically building up to Kill Bill and really exploding with Kill Bill is, um, I've seen this mo- these movies that you have not, 
Um, and so I'm sort of going to just inject them into my movies. Uh-huh. And I'm going to recreate literal scenes of these B movies, these American B movies, these like Asian movies that like nobody he really has seen. pushes what is reference. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And he I mean, like it still shows talent because you can't like the way that he sews it all together is still very impressive. But it is a lot of taking from other people and doing this mm-hmm. in once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Right. And then it sort of fell off after Kill Bill. And then uh, sometimes he pushed it, sometimes he didn't. But in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, when he goes to do it, they are actual uh, Jack Dalton scenes right. from movies. He That's contextualizes the all of the stuff that he wants to do. And then every scene that isn't from a movie or TV show, he just says, here is how the actual QT who has learned from his first eight movies would shoot it. And all of that pastiche shit sort of goes away. Uh-huh. And I think that's what makes the movie stand... One of right. the reasons that the movie stands out more than anything else. It's like he does it because he still, like, it's in him. It's instinctual. He wants to do pastiches. But he's also, like, almost tired of 30 years of people saying all you do is stitch together other stuff. And he's like, okay, motherfuckers. He's tired and he's not a kid anymore. Like, when he was a kid, he was watching 10 of these movies a day. You know? Like, and now his, his library may have run out. And I know that he still like um, he owns the New Beverly and still like picks what they show mm-hmm. and watches those movies and those are all very obscure movies. Uh-huh. But at a certain point, he just said like I still think it's fun, but I'm going to uh, like ingest it into the movie. I'm going to uh-huh. make it diegetic or whatever that word is. And I think with, with, with you can see with all of his movies, but especially here, like he is somebody who is obsessed with mythos, and this is one of the eras like it. How, the mythologizing of Hollywood kind of goes away for a while. I would love to watch him make a movie about like the New York punk scene in the mid seventies, because anytime there's something where people are larger than life and you know, half the stories you've heard are fake. I think he's really into that. Cause he, yeah. maybe he doesn't know what's real and what isn't real. And that's why he's obsessed with it so much. One and- thing that I thought was interesting about what is like, what is considered pop culture in this, which I think is a very accurate definition which is like including a ton of commercials Mm -hmm. i thought it was really interesting the way it's not just about movies and very popular stories there are just whole commercials from 69 that get played in the background for like mug root beer it's not just all the the fake products that he creates for his movies there's like actual commercials and again like i think that like i could bring up to you guys right now a commercial that i watched this week and there's almost zero percent chance that you guys saw it because you would have to like go through yeah. my exact week and watch my exact shit to see it. And I think that Tarantino sort of hates that. I think that there's so many movie marquees and so many TV shows, TV shows on at the right, right time. And I know there was like three networks and there's multiple theaters. But really, it was the last of – or like when the shared monoculture – yeah, when the yeah that shared pop culture and was all together. I think you see a couple times like that movies are running in theaters for like eight months at a time, right. right? Because everybody is having enough time to watch Romeo and Juliet like four times and talk about it. And so I know the FBI, a show that Jack Dalton guest starred on, is up against two other shows, and but like it's still like uh, one of those shows would dominate, and everyone would basically watch all of the same stuff. All, yeah. at, like you had the you had the opportunity if you disregarded independent shit that you could see literally everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. People people Not didn't then. Yeah, people <laughs> people didn't then when they had the chance and now we try to now when there is no chance. But yes, this monoculture that linked everyone together and you can make any reference to anything at any time you wanted and everyone from uh the Manson girls to the guy who like owns your your local green grocer to Rick Dalton would all understand exactly what you're talking about. Uh-huh. And now we're at the point where uh Greg you'll be like uh altered carbon and Mike and I will be like, what the fuck is that? Yeah, you Why'd you even get, bring I'll it up? You, you get very angry. But, you know, season two is out right now, guys. So. Shut your this, mouth. This, Go watch this, the OA, nerd. It, it, costs, it costs so much to make. You guys can't just watch it. There's boobs for days. And a lot of dong, Mike. I know you're... Oh, okay, good. I'm in. Yeah. But it's almost like pop culture is to this movie, or like the commercials and the TV and the movies, is almost like uh, in the early 1920s and 10s when trains were coming at the screen <laughs> it's almost like that person who plays the piano in the theater like they're just wailing on the pop culture all of these points throughout uh-huh. the entire movie <laughs> um but it does it in a way that doesn't feel empty right like i i feel like he does it with a love of this mm. pop oh, culture and that love like transfers like yeah. i'm never like oh or another commercial i feel warm uh-huh. and i feel nostalgic for a time that i did not exist in uh-huh. but i did exist in a time that had its own time like that mm-hmm. It, it made me miss ours. I miss the Snapple lady. I miss the Pine Saw lady. It made me miss I, the commercials of my youth. 
Do you guys remember the Snapper Lady? Should be a podcast just about her. Another thing that does that I really like is uh, they like, and I think this fits with your point, Ryan, which is they that scene where they watch the episode of FBI and then just like the background chatter of the two of them is like, yeah, no, this guy's a good guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they uh, they MSC three K that show. <laughs> yeah, check it out here. Is it going to be the stuntman? And then this is me. <laughs> and, you, and you know, Cliff is riffing off the top of his nog. Rick wrote his riffs all day. <laughs> That's how they are. But what, what's so like, so there's this love of, of the pop culture language of commercials and all that, but it's also juxtaposed against the horror story of pop culture like yeah. that ha- there's no way that's not on purpose where it's like here's all the warm things you love about the culture but once you love something you're going to be even more freaked out when a celebrity dies yeah like, and then yeah going back attention going back to the whole right. tarantino thing like he couldn't do this movie and not show the behind the scenes of all the stuff that he learned throughout his career uh-huh. uh, his his 12 rick dalton that he grew up with were all fucking terrible people yeah. in fact he probably didn't go too far i bet rick dalton is 10 times more pure and genuine than most of the rick daltons that really right. existed dude that's so true because right. he's a blowhard and an asshole and everything like that but he's not like out there doing really objectionable shit which probably like nine out of ten of those dudes really were doing some stuff that would and I'm, your toes i'm at the age now where like the the worst thing that he does is go out at a, a scream at a car full of kids their uh, car is too loud i totally yeah that's he should be doing that it's get a, out there it's and a scream cul-de-sac out. you're not lost don't smoke your reefer here hippies i'm pro team <laughs> rick there oh they were very lost but just not in the way of like i don't know what address i'm going to Speed round. Uh-oh, that means we've entered into a take-no-prisoner speed round. Despite Should I release all the pre- previous prisoners I've taken then? Yeah, okay. you know what? Quick note, guys. we got to stop taking prisoners. Uh, <laughs> I thought a we weird agree- move. I thought we agreed on one per show. Yeah, no, we got to let all these people go. Okay. It's, I gotta, I'll gotta. i tell you about it off air, but we got to hold... Yeah, we got to get rid of these people. We'll we get rid of... I mean, we'll... <laughs> get rid of meaning let them go. Despite almost being three hours, Once Upon a Time has almost no narrative momentum. How does this work for the movie, and what advice can it give other films that attempt this? I mean, I would say definitely have cast Leo and Brad Pitt. Yeah, uh-huh. that helps. And if you can't do that, then just know ahead of time that like your characters are going to gel. Yeah. And I'm not saying that this movie feels like improvised. I don't think this feels like a Leo and Brad hangout. But the way that these two characters that they're playing, because they're acting as different people, Uh um, works enough where, like, there was no... I can't think of a segment of this movie, uh, like a 10- or 12-minute episode of this movie, that I was like, oh, come on, let's skip through this. That's so true. That's so true. And even, like, this is advice to people. You probably can't watch in a theater currently, but pretend you are. Turn off your phones, because just because you don't get that some... A scene is quiet, like we've said before with Robbie, dialogue does not equal importance, Please just yeah. pay attention to the thing in front of you here. But once again, it's another movie, just like when Pulp Fiction came out and everyone learned the wrong things. Uh, this is another one where people are going to learn the wrong things. Yeah. He had stuff to say. He had a reason. He felt the forward uh, narrative momentum. He was going to make us feel it. But Do you think pe- there's going to be a bunch of these revisionist histories now? Where- uh, definitely. And yeah, it's going to be stuff with like literally no story. Yeah. And they're going to think, oh, all you have to do to be good is just not have a story. And that is the not- wrong <laughs> lesson. <laughs> What he's combining here is he has no story because we all know the real narrative. And then it's it's just like any time like we talked about comics a little earlier, if, if you're doing a what if, you can riff and play on what everybody knows. That this is how Martha and uh, not Martha died. And you can play with it. There's a tension here that the movie doesn't have that we all inherently have because we yeah. know the era it's in. And that yeah. could be lazy, but he's doing so much with it, and there's a propulsion. That's a really interesting that. point, is that if we didn't see the trailer, if we didn't know that right. the Manson family was there, um, would this movie be super boring until we got a taste of the Manson family? Yeah. Where, where we, we'd just be like, what the fuck are they doing I, here? I, honestly, I don't think so. And th- it's so weird the way the tension of knowing that event is coming hangs over this movie. And then after you know it doesn't, watching it again is like a completely different yeah. feeling. Even though there's... Yeah, you're still like, oh, man, there's going to be some screaming soon. <laughs> there's definitely going to be some people screaming up a storm. What, if anything, does this movie say about friendship? That we do it better than anybody else, I think. That we're the guys who do it the best? Like, this mm-hmm. this, this tried its hardest and is still only second best, you know, uh-huh. to this podcast. I like that. That's a good point. Right. Good point, drop pad. 
Mike, what do you think it says about friendship? I, I think it, it doesn't say directly, but the, you need a common thing. If you're just two friends who hang out, people uh-huh. will judge it. But if you're like, we have this shared project, people will be like, oh, I guess I'll allow this to happen as much as you need it to happen. And that's very important. <laughs> I love how it's like, like he's like my manservant. Uh huh. You know, it's like go home, fix the TV antenna, and then like take the rest of the day off. The other but thing it, too is that I think that like we think that friendships, especially in movies, but again in real life, is that they should be a hundred percent genuine. Yeah. And no friendship really is. You know, there is a little bit of like. Uh, well, I'm sure there's at least one. There's probably just the one though, but it's just the one in history. Uh, there's a little bit of using. There's a little bit of uh, I'm using you, and I'm also like for whatever, and then. I'm also using you to like make myself feel better. Uh-huh. That doesn't mean that it's not a good friendship. Yeah, you know? like there's a scene where uh, Brad Pitt drops Leo off, and he's like, Are "We gonna watch our my episode of FBI?" And Brad Pitt's like, "Fuck yeah, I got a six pack in the yeah. bag." <laughs> and they were they were even though they're so close, they were dancing around each right. other. They, they and, needed to be coy. And they're still they're using each other right there, but it's not not a friendship, you know? Yeah, yeah. Everybody, you just don't want to be alone. That's using, right. and it's also like an, uh, a thing because it's obvious to see what Leo gets out of Brad. Like, he's his manservant. But I think that's only sort of hinted at the edges of the movie is that Brad Pitt hasn't really worked in a long time, and Leo keeps paying him. Like, yeah. right. he's the friend who has it made. And even though his right. having it made is on the decline, he's helping this guy out. And he can't be like, I'll just give you money every month, because that would be emasculating. But so instead, he's like, yeah, I guess fix my TV antenna. Uh, well, the, the other thing, too, like is made that up chores. Leo knows that, or uh, what's his name? Rick? Rick knows how complicated Cliff's past is, and that's he sort of ignores that and doesn't believe it, which is you know no you can white see man his, on white man thing you can see in his face when it gets brought up, but also that he totally does believe it. That on some level he doesn't like to think about it because he thinks it happened. Rick it, almost exclusively, whether he's the hero, the antihero, the villain, plays these like badasses, and for then Cliff, who he knows to be an actual badass, killed yeah. his wife, was a stunt person, to say. You're, you're Rick fucking Dalton. You go get them. Like, that's so important He's to Rick. He's built up all the oh, more yeah. from that. Right. One of the, the scenes that I think is most interesting in the movie is when he goes to film the episode of Lancer. What are we seeing when we... What are we looking at as the audience when that scene is being filmed and performed? What re, What space, what plane of reality... Like, uh, like, because we see Bounty Law. Is that what you're talking about? And we see how it's a cheesy we, 50s show. We see Bounty Law, and it's the aspect ratio is square. It's mm. black and white. It's cut together like a show. This episode of Lancer, this is not what the TV show no. Lancer is. Tarantino's had. not going to have us go through all of these Leo moments in a 50s style. Yeah. So he's just saying, fuck that. But, and then on top of that, there is much reference to people behind the camera. Mm-hmm. So it, it exists in this weird other space. I, I think that scene it highlights this is what the mad like what he's showing us this is how magical it fucking feels when everybody's right, on yeah. fire in it like right. I mean, especially that, even if, if a, the director comes up and he's like oh man that line you made up like it's like everybody's so grooved in that they are becoming their characters in a way we don't see in the rest of the movie and the line he made up is super racist oh yeah, yeah. he's like I love it. Is it weird that I said that Mexican slur in the middle of it? He's like, no, not at all. <laughs> I loved it. And what we also are definitely missing is, uh, you know, when you're making a show, there's going to be – you have to pick up a glass in a close-up and bring it to your mouth 15 times. Yeah. That's not the part that we're going to see, you know? Yeah. That's not magical. I like – yeah, I like the idea of it being like that the magic of Hollywood is imbuing this. And so even this TV show feels like a big-budget movie right. in these moments. And then even when there are awkward lapses – at times, you know, that even that is like, there can still be the, the magic there at the same time. Well, that is the end of the speed round. When we come back, we're going to do something a little bit different and do not freak out. It's all going to be okay, but it's just a little different than what we normally do. You're talking to me, Mike, or the audience? And I'm going to freak the fuck out, dude. No, nobody freak. Okay. <laughs> well, do freak out on the other side of this sound effect. We're going to give out some awards guys we usually do this at the end of the year but you know what we like it too darn much and so we're going to award some actors some moments our vaunted moodies our first category is pound for pound performance in the film who gives us our best p for p mike the p for p i find it like this feels obvious but watching it and thinking about it a lot i don't know how not to do Leo does so much here with, like, the Hollywood charming guy. And uh-huh. it, it's crazy. I, I can't see who else it would be. 
this award is called Pound for Pound, and I feel like that sets it up for because Pound for Pound means like it's not about screen time; it's about yeah. what you did, and that sets it up for Julia Butters, right? Mm-hmm. What yeah. she, what she. What she did in her time, not just with her big monologue about like how to tell stories uh-huh. and how, just so you know, bud, you're clearly fading away like the uh, main character of the novel you're reading. Uh-huh. Uh, but then also after she acts and like, no, I've got elbow pads. You did so good. Uh-huh. But it has to 100%. I get why Brad Pitt won the Legacy Oscar. It's Leonardo DiCaprio for sure. Someone who I've never been fully convinced belonged, in, like deserved all the stuff that people said about him uh-huh. until this movie. So you are both going with Leonardo DiCaprio. Five. He's well, the winner. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, you're wrong. It is Brad Pitt. Uh, the depiction of just like so much going on beneath the surface, but you can like feel the warp and weave of it uh, as the viewer. Like you know what is going on in those deep emotional waters. What do you guys think about the acting like uh, criticism of I forgot it was them? Do you guys buy that? Like, how often do you forget that that the star Literally is never. actually performing? I'm not an idiot, so I've never run from a train on screen. So, like, <laughs> I'm never like, oh, the Blair Witch might have happened. Like, so, yes. I think you understood all the points like, I was trying it, to make. It's entertaining when you that when they're no – like, if you've seen enough interviews and, like, this is a normal Leo take and he's not doing it, that's impressive. But at no point have I ever been like, who's Margot Robbie? <laughs> right right now, I am using that gif of Homer stepping back into the bush, because that is what I think the question asks, which is who recedes into the character, not did you forget who the actor was, Mike, you fool. Uh, and I did. Brad, this felt like a very different Brad Pitt character, this sort of like mildly, well, like more and more sinister seeming guy, uh, but still charming and like still whips off his shirt and you're just yeah. absolutely in love. He's 55. Yeah, he is. That, guy, that torso is 55. Hey, I still have plenty of time to look like that before I'm okay. 55. Well, the answer is, of course, Brad Pitt, so that one's going to go. Greg. To Greg, So yeah. you agree with the Oscars, then? I agree with the Oscars, as always. Of course, that's why we have them, so that we know what to think about the films. <laughs> Cringiest moment. Mike? I, it's hard. We, it came up earlier in the show. It's hard not to be when Brad Pitt finally talks to the hippie. And they're chatting. There's no reason to go up her jean shorts and fully see her ass. Uh-huh. Uh, it was. I was like, dude, I'm no, I'm not into what's happening. And she's, she's kind of rocking back and mm-hmm. forth, and it's just like, if she like, there's porn that's less pornographic <laughs> than that. That's a dirty move. Like you watch yeah. that scene, and you're just like, I don't, you know, and you, but I, you can't help because it's in the foreground, and so you're like. I don't know. Like he makes you feel like such a creeper yeah. in that moment. That's a Ryan. That's a really good one. What do you think is the cringiest moment? It, it is, especially uh, I watched this movie in 3D. And man, <laughs> Earls, Earls. I, uh, we do- <laughs> and titties, titties. I have this cardboard stand up of Mike that uh-huh. it's arm moves, and the, there's like a robot in the back that just says <laughs> ass over and over again. <laughs> uh, we talked about a lot of the in context ones, like the ones that are in the movie with uh-huh. Bruce Lee and Margot Robbie. Um, and the butt, but I want to do an out of context one. It's hard for me to defend Quentin and all of the decisions that he makes. And then he goes and casts Emil Hirsch oh, shit, as Jay Sebring. Yeah. And Emil Hirsch wasn't me too in the typical way. Uh-huh. Uh, but instead he got drunk and talked to at a bar at Sundance, I believe, um, talked to a Paramount executive, uh, who did not think that, uh, she was replying to his advances good enough, uh, grabbed her by the throat, drug her across a table and uh, threw her on the ground and started choking her. And she said in the court case that it felt like the front of my neck and the back of my neck were touching. She passed out. He went to jail for 15 days. And then no, and then he became unhirable until Tarantino said, I wow. need to put you in my movie. Why would you do that? We have so many actors. There's so many actors. Yeah. Oh. And, and I don't, he, he didn't bring something to Jay, whatever his name is, that nobody else could have. That, that role has very little. It felt purposeful. Especially if you have the reputation of Tarantino, you know? Like, yeah, we're right. right on the fence with you, bro, with everything. Don't push us over. See, by- and that it feels it feels like he's doing that to be provocative. And then that feels like it misses the point so entirely that it really, that's the kind of thing that calls the rest of the well, movie into that's, question. That's, I mean, even geniuses can, like, he, I mean, there's, he's always had a punk rock, I'm doing this just to get under your skin. Just because you're better and a little older at making art doesn't mean you're still not an asshole. And so and we've he got- still has the provocative just for provocative's sake. We've got this thing where he served his time. He went to jail for 15 days. He did serve the time that the judge said, 
So I'm not saying necessarily he needs to go back and do more time voluntarily. Uh-huh. That is what the judge said. But that doesn't mean that – so we then automatically accept him back into being on big right. screens yeah. into the Hollywood world. Into what is supposed to be one of the most important – I mean, honestly, this movie is made to be like one of the most important movies of all time. And then he, he taints it up. Uh, kind of in that same vein, and you brought her up just a second ago, Ryan, the little girl – actress julia butter um she delivers a a wonderful performance and she's very funny but there's two things i there are a couple things i really don't like one is uh i really don't like when rick dalton says to her you'll see in 14 years yes uh, a grim reminder that that that's when that little girl would be like leaving the age right. range that leonardo dicaprio is himself interested in that sort of weird like his his own personal dating history coming into the movie and then being projected at this little girl. That's fucked up, dude. I thought it was just a funny aside joke. And About her career dying? That's yeah. fucked up. Um, and it's just really sharp and really mean to like this character that we're made to care about and is one of the only women we get to hear say anything in the entire movie. And then I find it further kind of gross the way he throws her on the ground in the scene uh, without considering like whether she's gonna be okay or not and then the little girl's like it's okay it, it, it turns out i was and then she's like that was the best acting i've ever seen i just felt like that encapsulated all the different ways in which movies and including this movie harm women and then just being very like nonchalant about it, it. it's almost like backing up negging mm-hmm. like yeah julia butters comes in and like she acts like she's better than me and then i fucking i Give her an insult that she says, what? But I know she he- heard it. And yeah. then later on, she compliments me. And he didn't know that she had... In the reality of the movie, he didn't know that she had those pads on. And so this, to him casting her down and potentially hurting her for entertainment is like m- the microcosm of the entire movie. But, Ryan, I'm going to give Ryan. you the point because he told on himself even harder than that by putting this creepy fucking creeper in the movie. This is what I mean. Like, I'm, I'm not comfortable liking this movie as much as I do because of stuff like that. That's so gross. And I feel like it's... Do you, you give the movie a pass if you don't – I don't know, if you enjoy it. Or at, a, at a certain point, you have to come to terms with the fact that you're either, uh, like, saying okay to things or just straight up ignoring them. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the only two options. All right. Next award goes to – or next award is in the category of director signature moment. For me, my director signature moment is that big pop culture they made us murderers speech. Mm. Uh, this movie almost doesn't have the pop culture speech in it. And then right at the end, here comes a swooping in. One of the characters just saying something that it sounds like maybe Quentin Tarantino thought or said at one time or in the style of that, but just an exegesis of pop culture and what it means. Yeah. It's, su- uh, it's super Tarantino, but it's also young and naive. And it's hard for me to tell if he backs that up and he wants to prove that point. Or if he's saying, look how stupid right. people are when they think shit like this. I wonder if it's something he himself actually wrote when he was closer to that character's right. age. Because it feels profound then, and later you're like, what? And something like, so that's <laughs> that's Ma- that's Max from Better Things Better He Says Better It. Things. And all the, all the mans and girls are either like young, up-and-coming Hollywood starlets or Hollywood children. Like Maya Hawk yeah. and Harley Quinn's Kevin Smith's daughters and like that crowd. Like it feels like purposely like, no, we are making the people killing people. Like, so she represents all of them saying, you made us the way we uh-huh. are, and then you're making their actual kids do it. It's, I don't know yeah. what he's fully saying there, but it's interesting. Is and, it right? And I mean, Ethan and Uma, not to sound like David Letterman hosting the Oscars, but Ethan and Uma are both like, they're very outspoken about how Maya Hawk, their daughter, is like, um, I don't know, this very confident woman who is ready to make her own choices. And yet, the second she said, hey... I'm. I got a part in the new Tarantino movie. Were they both like, no, please yeah. don't do that? Why would that be the first choice that you make? Do you guys think that Harley Quinn Smith and Margot Robbie ran into each other on set and like sort it of was weird? <laughs> for it out? No, I think it's a time cop situation. I don't think they can come in contact <laughs> with each other. Mike, what do you have for signature moment? Signature moment was, uh, I think there's a few that could be it, but the hardcore face smashing and like really zooming in. Uh, especially yeah. I think that's in most of his movies, but especially after no violence, the whole movie just like really getting that you're like, Oh, Oh, Oh. And like real chunky, real so pulpy. Chunky and pulpy. pulpy. <laughs> Ryan, what do you got? Um, mine was uh, a little less uh, pejorative to the director because that's, I guess my role in this episode. It was that we didn't have somebody like in a trunk looking up. And so the 
you know, the actors looked into a trunk, which he loves. There was his camera was more calm than in any other movie uh-huh. he's ever done. Uh, so what I'm actually going to do is just the um, the inundation of pop culture and the like sort of force you to love it. I think that his job, he has taken on the role of saying, like, nobody understands how important pop culture is to our lives except for me. Uh-huh. And this was like the big culmination of all of that throughout all of his movies. So just sort of the pop culture bent. Just like how we can't move a foot without having pop culture everywhere. A little squish of pop culture. I What was Mike's again? The face uh, smash. ultraviolence. Ultra the face smashing. I'm going to give that one to Mike. Mike. Best car. This movie has some sweet rides in it. What do you think is the best car, Ryan? I I, I think this is a slammy D. Like, okay. I want to pick the Carmen Ghia. Is that what it's called? Uh-huh. That uh, would be a good choice. Because uh, it's so tiny, and but apparently if you drive it right, you can do some things with it, like uh-huh. murder children. But uh, Leo's uh, Cadillac Coupe de Ville, the one that said, where Brad Pitt says, like, this is my boss's car, uh-huh. and makes a Manson kid change the tire... I think that car is the most iconic from the movie. Yeah. It has to win the award. Beautiful, cream-colored. Uh, also, Carmagia might lose some points because the Carmagia was notably underpowered, and so they put uh, like a modern Subaru engine in it because it, it wouldn't drive like that. It was, like a, it was a car that was supposed to kind of like look nice, but it was like it had the same engine as a Beetle. So that was the car that was like uh, if you wanted to look rich but you weren't? Yeah. It was, yeah, like, uh, it was supposed to kind of be like a poor man's Porsche. All right, Mike, what do you got? What's the oh, best fuck. car? The uh, MGTD Polanski's car is just, it okay. looks timeless. It could exist in the 40s or in the 60s or 70s, and is fucking gorgeous. And movies love the MGs, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the, the What is it? The Graduate has that classic MG in it. That's pretty good. Those are good answers. But there is, of course, one correct answer. I forgot there's a fucking Porsche in this Sharon movie. Sharon Tate. God damn it, dude. Has a 1969 911L, and it appears... She has the Sportomatic gearbox because you do not see Margot Robbie shifting. Although with the Sportomatic gearbox, you still had to like throw the uh, stick. You just didn't have a clutch, uh, and it, from what I've heard, is not a very good uh, gearbox. But that's okay. She's not going to do her own rowing. That's fine. Just a beautiful car, though. These sixty era Porsches. Uh, before they had to put a lot of things on to make them safer, like skirting and stuff. They're just a very beautiful, the pure distillation of the Porsche 911 body type. And of course, Greg. that's the best. I, I also would have accepted the 1969 Porsche Targa, <laughs> uh, which was seen briefly in the background outside that restaurant where they meet Schwarz. The Targa, of course, has the roof that you could pop off. It's not really Of course it does. Yeah, I do, real quick. Two seconds. I just want to say that like uh, this movie does have this thing where it sort of hates hippies, and that's all over the place. <laughs> but I think that there's sort of an argument being made because Margot Robbie picks up a hippie in her Porsche, uh-huh. and it's like super pleasant to her, drives her around, lets her hitchhike, and that it's not that the hippies were bad, but the people like Rick Dalton and Cliff Booth made the hippies bad. Yeah. You know, like Max says, because if we were all just Sharon Tate to them, yeah. then everything would have been fine. Yeah. Because but- that, that is a totally pleasant hitchhiking. Uh-huh. <laughs> The first time in movie history. Seriously, this is the only hitchhiking that ever went well. Tarantino-iest line. What is the Tarantino-iest line of the entire movie? Mike, let's start with you. Uh, I'm going to cheat. I have a tie. We call this rhyming. Uh... Oh, oh, come oh, on. Damn. Fuck you. Because one is he does a very long drawn out and then one very sharp punch punch. So my long drawn out is uh, from the narrator. Uh, and it also hit very close to home. But it's when you come to the end of the line of the buddy who's more than a brother and less than a wife, getting blind drunk together is really the only way to say farewell. There's so many syllables but, in that one sentence. <laughs> but I love how you blame me for cheating and then just talked about me and you in that and line. And then uh, the punch punch, it's uh, Gypsy and Cliff. It's we love pussy. Yes, we do. So <laughs> Lena Dunham is saying, we love pussy, talking about the person, and Cliff, Brad Pitt, is responding, yes, we do. And it's, that's the very, that's, oh yeah, he's funny. He's a funny man. Ryan, what do you think it is? Uh, I'm going to go through this real fast, because my favorite Tarantino dialogue is how um, people talk fast, but what I really like it is when they slow down time, uh-huh. and they just explain things in a cool way. Uh, well, actors are required to do a lot of dangerous stuff, say Jake Cahill gets shot off his horse. Now, can I fall off a horse? Yes, I can. <laughs> yes, I have. But say I fall off wrong and I sprain my wrist or twist my ankle. Now, that can put an undue burden on the production because now maybe I can't work for a week. So Cliff here is meant to help carry the load. And then there's a stupid jism joke right after that. Yeah. Of, yeah, do you carry the load? But uh, it reminds me of 
um, Jules explaining to Vince in Pulp Fiction what a pilot is uh-huh. and just slows down time to explain how the entertainment industry uh-huh. works. That was Tarantino to me. Also, do you think Shakespeare would ever miss a chance to make a pun on load? No. No, absolutely yeah, not. Yeah, that guy threw in as much nut as he possibly <laughs> could. Into Off and on play. the page. Uh, that's a really good one. Those are both really strong ones. Mine is short and to the point, but uh, I think really captures the feel of the movie, which is don't cry in front of the Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say the the other word that he said when he was improvising on the set. That Probably a good move. I'm going to give it to Ryan. Ryan. That is a great line. All right. Most appropriate. Most appropriate. This is what makes this one difficult. Mm-hmm. Use of bare feet. Mike? Uh, Leo in the pool. Listen to his. It's Leo in the pool. You're in a pool. What else can it be? <laughs> That's what you should not have shoes on. You're in a pool. <laughs> and it's like uh, he's in this his chair that like he sort of rehearses in, uh-huh. and the feet are up front in the camera, and then he sort of floats through the pool, and it's not the other times like Margot Robbie in the theater or Margaret Qualley in the uh-huh. car, and she like. She doesn't put them on the dashboard. She puts them on the dashboard where she knows the camera to be. She puts them on the, on the glass. glass. Yeah, so uh-huh. you get the footprint. Yeah, it's smashed she tight up them. against it like a butt on a shower. As if Tarantino is in one of those things where you would drop yeah. a quarter in and the thing would come up and uh, you would watch a girl in a booth. A peep show. It, it, but, so much uh, of this movie, he's teasing us because so many of the Manson kids are running around without shoes the whole time and he's not zooming in. So I'm like, oh, fuck him. He's, he's like, oh, you no, expect I, it? I, I, Honestly, I find that anytime you can see someone's foot, even for a moment, I'm like skied down. <laughs> he made, he's done this. He's made this way too much about his thing. And I think the one in the car, I think that's supposed to be his ultimate like wink. You know, uh, obviously, I've done this a lot in my career. Obviously, it's a little weird, but also here they are all smushed up against the glass. Oh God! <laughs> but <laughs> fucking throw up. It's it's way too much. I never want to think about it. But I, it, I think it hits on all the feet. The women feet hit on both of our theories of. Um, like one, it's not a big deal. Like I'm just starting a conversation. I don't really. Or two, if this is my fucking, if this is my magnum opus, I'm gonna get those feet. <laughs> get those I'm gonna feet fill it. it with feet. His thing is obviously big feet, and that's why he does them. Like put them in the foreground, and then they're like as big as the girl herself. This guy's got serious problems. <laughs> and so I'm gonna say it's not possible. <laughs> it's not possible for him anymore to have any characters that are just barefoot. And I'm gonna give. Greg. Myself the point. Greg, you're a you're the biggest Star Trek fan of the I three am. of us. I am. Is anybody ever barefoot in any Star Trek thing since Star Trek was created? You know, there is something, especially in the early seasons, which is like sometimes there's like a sexual Picard episode. There's a lot of sexual Riker episodes. Like one of the first episodes of Star Trek, Riker is like, wait, can I fuck one of the holograms in this room? <laughs> he seriously is like, ask the hologram. He's like, how far can this simulation go? He wants to put his penis oh, in yeah, it. Yeah, he does. But every once in a while... There'll be an episode where Picard like goes and gets sexy on a planet. It's like I got I have a break, so I'm gonna go. And he wears like a slinky little robe by the pool. And in those moments, you could definitely see his bare feet. Some his some bare Star- feet. Yeah, some Star Trek uh, Next Generation episodes are pretty horny. There's like a lot of horny Star Trek, but Next still Generation. so much less horny from the original series. They really dehorned the whole. Yeah, that's the thing is that is that a throwback to the original series because that was Shatner being horny in every episode, uh, right? It's a different type of horny. Shatner is a different horny energy than exists. The the next gener like Shatner's horny energy is like jock horny mm-hmm. energy. The next generation horny energy is very much like theater kid horny energy, <laughs> which is like very very powerful but comes out in like really weird <laughs> ways. Does Picard say like it would be such a shame if like a wind blew up by and my shoes <laughs> <He> came <does>. off? <laughs> I seen my bare feet, of course. You've seen everything. Well, that is the end of the award show. Any of those moments can come down to the studio and get their awards. When we come back, we're going to wrap up this episode, and I'm going to tell you who won. And if we think Once Upon a Time in Hollywood has a chance to take this season down. Mike, you scored 41 American points. That's a lot of American points. That is the most anyone had ever scored on any one single round of this show. The most anyone had ever scored. So Mike won? Up until I tabulated Ryan's score, and he actually... Scored more. He scored 46. So Jesus Ryan Christ. won. How many did I get? You got 46. 46. 46 points. Very good. So obviously, Ryan, that's, you set the record by 
five points. That's incredible. A record that had stood for, I guess, seconds? Maybe one second? <laughs> Ever? Yeah, I guess I'm both proud that I did it, but also disappointed I didn't do it harder. Once again, Mike, you're my silver dollar friend. And that's, of course, a reference to your nipples, which are the size of silver dollars. But uh, not not the, the shell ones, not the <laughs> currency ones. And they are also uh, stubbly, like the, the sand dollars mm-hmm. of our youths. But, so obviously Ryan has triumphed here, but... Because of my defense of this racist, sexist idiot. Yeah, because <laughs> you fought so hard. To make sure this problematic movie would go forward. But how do we think it's going to do in the bracket? I think that we talked about a lot in the intro show how this bracket has a monster. Uh-huh. And we've also talked about in this show how, Greg, you're a slave to the Oscars. I am. And Parasite won Best Picture. Um, to me, it always comes down to uh, this movie was great in its perfection or this movie was great in its messiness. Uh-huh. And Once Upon a Time is definitely the second one. Right, there's nothing perfect about it. No, but can its messiness beat Parasite? And I also am wondering if Parasite is also messy. Once we rewatch it, will yeah. we think that maybe it's like it's the more than the sum of its parts for these two movies? We've all seen Parasite. Yeah. Okay. It's a shame that none of us w- would watch it for the first time because that's like kind of the truest experience mm-hmm. of it. Obviously, is, is watching it for the first time. And I guess that could be said about this movie as well. This movie, to me, I think. Uh, I like it. It's very good. I enjoy doing a show about it. I think it's got way too much baggage to to, to advance very far. Um, it's just you, at least one third of us feel very uncomfortable with a lot of it. it so I can I, see that really hampering it. I can see how the baggage makes for a good podcast episode. Yeah. But when we're just like pairing these movies up next to each other, uh, does the baggage slow it down? Yeah. I could definitely see that. Uh, but maybe... Maybe it has what it takes. We'll have to see on the other side of the season because we've got more movies to watch now. In fact, Mike, do you have your magical mystery D8? You're lucky you just have a couple of nerds with dice and lists you, near them. You literally <laughs> opened up a drawer at the desk <laughs> at which you're sitting, and you're just like, yep. <laughs> just grabbed, it's not even a D20. It's a D8, which he just has on hand. Uh, well, you never know. Obviously, you never know. Obvi- yeah. So... I'm going to roll. It is, oh, it means nothing, so there's no point in building up. It's a five. <laughs> the number five. And Ryan will tell us what the fifth movie is. Uh, your fifth seed, according to this, is actually the movie that's com- going up against Once Upon a Time. It is Midsommar. Midsommar! Oh, no! Oh, no, it's here! Oh, Greg's going to be so scared of pants. <laughs> it's, it's here. It's arrived. Now, next week, we have to actually shove a tweener in. Uh-huh. Uh, we're going to yeah, talk about other like stuff. Sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Context. When a doubt, shove a tweener in. So we're going to talk about, uh, you know, state of the franchise or whatever. Okay. But two weeks from now, yeah, let's do this, get, bro. Get prepared to be terrified. Well, here's what we're going to do, guys. We've gone so long tonight. We are just going to hit the commercials real quick. Mike, tell me of websites. Yourpopfilter.com is where you can get all the things we do. Yourpopfilter.com slash Amazon is how you can help us out and still shop at Amazon, which you're used to. Patreon.com slash Yourpopfilter is how you can get extra content and help us out. Very good. Social media, we're available at Yourpopfilter on Twitter, at Yourpopfilter on Instagram, and email. You can email us at contacts at Yourpopfilter.com, and we will send you contacts, Ryan. That's why we do that? Yes. Yeah. Because... We'll yeah, we're, we, I mean, like, we can't just do podcasts. So <laughs> if your eyes are getting a little cloudy and you need new contacts, email that and we will send you them. Ryan, what other podcasts could you get from fools like us? Well, there is, if you want me and Mike and less Greg and more Ooh, talk about the OC. That's offensive. Then uh, the superhero show show is there for you. Uh, that's when we have somebody from the Unnatural 20s named Cassie who comes in and walks us through all of the superhero shows that came out in that previous week. If you want even more OC talk than that, and on that show there is actually a lot, but if you want more than that, <laughs> uh, then also subscribe to the OCD where Mike and I take a very long very casual stroll through every episode of the OC that has ever come out. Yeah, you guys have been making that show for a long time. <laughs> Once upon a time, dot, 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 in Orange County is our approach. And if you listen to the Superhero Hour Hour and you think uh, less Mike and Ryan, more Cassie, then subscribe to The Unnatural 20s. Please actually subscribe to all three of those shows and Movie of the Year. Rate them. Review them. We appreciate it. Thank you. Tell a friend Good them. night. Tell a friend them. Well, that is our show for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. 
you will hear some sort of tweener nonsense next week. But until then, keep watching them movies. I loved it.